Right. There's a lot of words up there, aren't there? Rather too many. So let's try and make some sense of them in order to enable us to think about it. How many people have we got on the earth at the moment? Just over 7.7 .7 billion people. Right? Before 1928, we'd never had 2 billion people on the planet. So, if you recognize those of you who have had to deal with parents and uncles and aunts and sisters and brothers, or those of you who've had to deal from a slightly older age with children, if you recognize it's jolly difficult to organize other people at more or less any scale, if you now try to organize people at enormous scales, you ought to recognize it becomes extraordinarily difficult. So the first problem in terms of dealing with all of these types of challenges is actually figuring out how to get people to do things that are not conflictual, not destructive, and are broadly speaking collaborative in the direction of common purpose. We've heard today about Della Rovere Popes. We've heard about the crisis of Syria and displaced populations on an unprecedented scale from a single conflict. We've heard of the challenges of preventing the destruction of historical artifacts of enormous cultural significance. And I'm going to come back to Belton Road in just a moment, so don't feel bad about it. So, the second problem is that all of this human stuff is taking place in an Earth system. It's taking place in something that I'm calling here a planetary biogeosphere. Now, what's important about that is simply that what is happening in terms of disruption of weather patterns in the context of climatic change is just one manifestation of what is happening in terms of that biogeosphere, that Earth system in multiple ways. We're wiping out biodiversity. The World Wildlife Report that was published in October last year suggests that we wiped out around 40% of biodiversity in the last 60 years. The IPCC report that was published in October last year suggests that we've got 12 years before we hit an inflection point in terms of climate and in terms of the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that will make it impossible for us to contain warming to 1.5 degrees above target date. And anyone who knows anything about what is happening in the oceans, apart from ocean acidification, which is a great threat to biodiversity around coral reefs and a whole variety of other ecosystems within the ocean, think a little bit about plastic pollution. And those of you who come from developing countries know perfectly well what the landscape looks like in terms of the extent of the litter uh, in terms of plastics. So 7.7 .7 billion people pushing dramatically up against limitations of natural capital and, if you like, up against planetary boundaries. That's the challenge. Now, what are we trying to do about it? We don't want a catastrophe. We'd like to find a way of preventing catastrophe. So in order to do that, we have to try to induce patterns of human behavior that are less conflictual, less destructive, more cooperative at scale. And what I'm suggesting to you is that is a truly wicked problem because it's all about complex systems and complex adaptive systems. So the first question, this is just to be provocative, don't take it too seriously, but the first question is a question that was posed by John Gray. And he actually argued, after a very long dissertation, that moral progress is impossible. And he defined progress as any kind of advance that's cumulative, so that what's achieved at one period is the basis for later achievement, and that over time becomes more and more irreversible. 
So he argues in science and technology that happens, but he says the myth is that progress achieved in science and technology can occur in ethics, politics, or more simply civilization. Now, I'm giving you that so that you can disagree with it. I'm not suggesting to you that you should all become recumbent and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it then. Life's going to get worse. We can't make any moral progress. So obviously, with the scale of the challenge we've got, life is going to become intolerable. Because, I'd argue, that's not actually true. I know his arguments quite well. I've had this argument with him. But that's not really the point for our present purposes. Our present purpose is it's actually and that's tough if you're Syrian, but it's actually, in terms of the aggregate of humanity, the best time in history to be alive. There is, objectively speaking, far less famine, war, and early death, and every indicator you can take across the Human Development Index, in terms of infant mortality, child mortality, maternal mortality, longevity, etc., suggests that in aggregate, Humanity is in a better state today than it's been. And strangely enough, much of the stuff that I'm going to be highly critical of has contributed materially to that. Firstly, risk-taking through limited liability companies, which enabled investment to take place which couldn't have taken place otherwise and allowed for an aggregation of technological progress. And additionally... The phenomenon of globalization, which, as you'll see in a moment, I argue has gone far too far, but the phenomenon of globalization, the creation of multinational corporations, the development of financial digitization, long value chains in terms of manufacturing, all of these things, whichever way you slice it, have taken roughly 2 billion people out of extreme poverty in the past 30 years. So when you look at it in the aggregate, stuff that has happened at scale, has advanced the aggregate of welfare. Most of that poverty reduction, by the way, has occurred in China. India hasn't done terribly well. Africa's done very badly in respect of these. But the application of the rules of the game, rigidly and rigorously, has actually had a positive effect. Now, I'm going to leave a thought with you not because I'm going to be able to answer it perfectly this afternoon, but it's the sort of thing that I think it's worthwhile thinking about. The thesis I'm going to advance to you is that humans do something consistently that's perfectly understandable, but a bit dysfunctional. We develop rules of the game that seem to work, and then we push them to their limits. And of course, when you push any system to its limits, it breaks. And that's how we behave. Now, you see it in terms of business cycles. You see it in terms of stock exchange cycles, boom and bust. You see it in terms of tourism. You see it in terms of construction. You see it in terms of all sorts of things. And I would argue that that's how humanity behaves in the aggregate. And I'd argue that the problems that are the product of the present arose from the successes of the recent past. But it has got better. Anyone who wants the slides can have them, so I'm not going to speak to every individual slide. But as you can see, extreme poverty, democracy, basic education, vaccination, literacy, child mortality, all of these things have got appreciably better over an extended period of time. Doesn't mean they're going to keep on getting better. Democracy in particular is under an enormous degree of strain under present circumstances. But nonetheless, that's the recent history. The challenge is here. And the challenge is here for three reasons. Firstly, the aggregate population is continuing to rise. The likely number of people on the Earth in 2025 is going to be somewhere between 9.3 and 9.7 billion. So that, if you take the top end, is 2 billion more than there are at present. That's associated with exceedingly rapid rates of urbanization. Roughly 57% of the world's population is urbanized today. We think that in 2050, roughly 67% is going to be urbanized. And if you do the arithmetic quickly, you'll recognize that means 2.5 billion more people are going to be living in urban environments in 2050 
than were in urban environments in 2015. 90% of that urban growth is going to be in Asia and in Africa. It's not going to be a huge surge of urbanization in Europe. Most of that's happened and the population isn't growing. The places where the population are growing are parts of Asia. China's already slowed. India's about a decade behind that. But parts of Asia are still growing. And Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East and North Africa are going gangbusters. They still have the majority of their populations under the age of 25. So that means 2.5 billion, 90%, something like 2.1 billion people are going to be accommodated in urban areas in places that don't have a lot of experience in large-scale urban construction. Huge challenge associated with that. Think a little bit about the problems of the intersection between climate change and the spread of disease that I know Dan Brooks spoke to you about, but in addition, we've just had a presentation in the narrow context of Pakistan. But think about that at scale in terms of the environments that I'm now describing. So that's a huge challenge. There's the 95% certainty range in respect of our predictions out to 2100. And as you can see, something like 11.4, 11.5 billion seems to be the number for 2100 if we haven't managed to destroy our species prior to that. And we might. Martin Rees, the British Astronomer Royal, now Lord Rees of Ludlow and former uh, president or oh, master of Trinity College, published a very interesting book back in 2003 which said, Our Final Century, question mark. And he curiously made the observation that there was roughly a 50% chance that humanity would survive the 21st century. Now, that sounds ridiculous or trivial or silly or something. Martin is none of the above. But when you hear it in that fashion, but if you think about the challenges that I've just been describing, it's not actually silly or funny. It's actually quite scary. So the simple reality is we have to fix it, but it's difficult doing it at scale. I said earlier that this pick your number between 7.7 .7 billion today and 11 point something billion by 2100 are all living inside an Earth system. And the characteristic elements of that Earth system have been very well detailed, in particular in two papers. There's a large body of literature. But one was with Johann Rockström as the lead author in Nature in 2011. The other was with Gunther Steffens as the lead author in Science in 2015. And broadly speaking, the argument is that we are pushing up against nine planetary boundaries. One, of course, is climate change. Secondly, is this broad biosphere integrity, so it's the biodiversity issue, both genetic and functional diversity, changes in land system in terms of more and more land under agrarian cultivation in order to provide food for a growing population, more and more people in cities, freshwater usage, biochemical flows, particularly in respect to the phosphorus and nitrogen cycles, largely through fertilizer and related crops, crop stimuli, as a consequence, ocean acidification, and then problems out here in respect of the overall effects in terms of atmospheric aerosol loading and stratospheric ozone depletion, which we don't know enough about to be able to measure accurately at present. That's why those areas are very gray. Now, if you think about it, this is a system. All of these interact on one another. This is an unfortunate representation of it, but it's the way that the Stockholm Resilience Center chooses to represent it but one needs to model this as a system to understand where the inflection points in that system are and where the problems are likely to arise. What are we trying to do? Well, we very sensibly, very cleverly, in 2016, adopted 17 sustainable development goals, now called the Global Goals, with a disgusting number of indicators and reporting reference points and all the rest of it, which no one in his right mind can possibly remember. And there, once again, is the problem. Because when something gets sufficiently complex, such that you can't carry it in your mind, it doesn't become a behavioral stimulus. You don't behave in accordance with it. All of you, I'm sure, 
have encountered over the past several years the Global Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals. How many of you can honestly say that any part of your behavior on a daily basis is influenced by these goals? Do you use them as a reference point for anything? And if you don't, by the way, you're not in the minority. You were in the great majority by definition. But it's a good illustration of the nature of the problem. We set targets for ourselves. We even measure performance towards those targets. But it doesn't significantly change our behaviors in any meaningful fashion. Now, if you think about it, there's no great magic in saying that, broadly speaking, we've got to get five things right if we're going to try and fix the problem. The first thing is, to the extent that growth is needed, it has to be socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. You can't separate those elements out any longer. You can't say, we need economic growth, and oh, yeah, we'll try and get as many people as possible inside the tent, and yeah, we'll try and do as little damage as possible. We don't have those options anymore. We're up against the margins everywhere. The problems of perceived social inequity due to significant social inequality are apparent right around the world. And we are pushing up against these planetary boundaries that I've just described in ways that are causing extreme weather events, in ways that are causing droughts and floods, in ways that are putting us under enormous pressure. I don't know who among you last ate a fish caught in the wild. Almost all fish that are available to people in urban areas today are farmed. Farming of fish produces all sorts of remarkable problems, not unlike those as a result of high-density agriculture, in terms of pollution of water tables and runoff from rivers, in the context of fish, it spreads significant genetic distortions and significant amounts of disease. It's not a sustainable strategy going forward. I don't want to get into the product of having large amounts of beef cattle and, and sheep on the land, but let's merely say that as a result of the double stomachs of cattle, the amount of methane production is disproportionately large and very problematical in the short term. So the first thing is we've got to, to the extent that we need growth, we have to engineer growth to be socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. Secondly, we've got to start thinking about problems of poverty and inequality through a lens of equity. Inequality is more or less normal. I don't know what the average income per capita of the people sitting in this room today, but I'm pretty sure it varies fairly considerably. And you're not going to change that by clicking fingers. But when people feel that the system is rigged against them, when people feel that they do not have an opportunity for advancement, when they feel that the people at the top of the tree got there through ill-gotten gains, then by definition, the social and the political system becomes completely unstable and society cannot demonstrate any form of cohesion. The third thing we've got to get right is we've got to start understanding what we mean by security. Security is reducing vulnerability. Now, you can reduce vulnerability in all sorts of different ways at all sorts of different scales. But the moment you realize that, then you must recognize that efforts at creating individual human security for a refugee from Syria in a refugee camp in Jordan is the same moral objective as creating national security for the United States of America or Russia. It's just a different scale. So individual or human security National security, regional security, and global security are all about reducing vulnerability at different scales. And therefore, ring-fencing allocations of money for national security as opposed to human security is actually fairly silly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating the abolition of every department of defense in the world. That's, that's not really the point. 
The point is just we've got to try and understand what we're trying to do. And if we're trying to reduce human vulnerability, then we should think about how we apply the monies and not merely ring fence things and apply the money in terms of the way it was applied last year. In certain circumstances, a focus on health, education, and housing is far more important than buying more aircraft and tanks. In certain cases, it may be necessary to increase border protection. But you've got to think about the issue before you lurch into the decision about it. Now, those three things, those are the three big things. How do we apply economic resources, socially inclusively and environmentally sensitively? How do we deal with major distortions in respect to poverty and inequality through a lens of equity? And how do we reconceptualize security in the context of the reduction of vulnerability? Those are the three big things. We got that right. This is more than Pareto efficient in terms of solving the problems of the world. But we can only do that if we agree on the norms we're going to apply in exercising those judgments. And that means that some form of compromise in respect of preferences has to take place so that values are better aligned. Very difficult. As I said, it's difficult enough to get your uncle to agree with you in respect of anything, or if you're a parent, your children. Trying to do it at the scale of 7.7 .7 billion across languages, cultures, belief systems, and everything else, extraordinarily difficult. But you can't solve for those problems at the level of 7.7 .7 billion in a constrained planetary biosphere unless you have a reasonable degree of normative coherence and unless we all become more flexible about recognizing the values of diversity in the context of humanity at large. And only then can we do something about fixing institutions of governance. Because institutions of governance operate on the basis of norms. Some norms we've elevated to the status of laws, whether they are domestic laws or international law in the context of treaties and the like. But you won't get reform of the Security Council with the permanent five members of the Security Council agreeing to dilute their ability to cause outcomes or prevent outcomes in the Security Council if you haven't agreed on a normative frame in order to get there. So you can see already at this stage of the game how complex the damn problem is. So let's have a look at it. That's a rough picture. It's about a year old. But that's a rough picture of the level of connectivity we have as a consequence of commercial flights. That's a rough picture, that's about a year and a half old, but that's a rough picture of the degree of connectivity we have as a consequence of the internet. That's a picture about what's going to happen as a consequence of Belt and Road, assuming that the 19th Party Congress five-year plan actually plays out the way it's intended to play out under present circumstances. Which one is the one belt? It doesn't really matter anymore because it now affects 82 countries directly and potentially 178 in total. It is, it is, and you know, one of the things that you didn't say this morning, but I realized from the way you were expressing yourself that you understand it. What happened, the reason why the Belt and Road Initiative was kicked off was because the financial crisis produced a massive devaluation of the dollar. At, and at that point in time, 92% of China's foreign exchange reserves were dollarized. They were in everything from T-bills out to 10-year notes. They decided we can't control what's happening out here. We don't believe anyone cares anything about us in the context of all of this. So the chairman of the central bank sent a message to the governors of the central bank saying quite simply, what liquidity do we need to maintain in dollarized format? And what surplus do we currently have that we can invest in something we can control? I've seen three of the 11 answers to that. I don't know what the others said, but the three that I've seen range between 800 billion and 1.3 trillion. They were sitting on 4.3 trillion at that point in time, and the Belt and Road is a strategy adopted in 2016 
to unlock the utility of that extra three billion plus what it's growing by on an annual basis. But they are learning by doing. Right? They're going to make mistakes left, right, and center as they do this because nobody's ever done anything like this at this scale in this time frame before, and this is across national boundaries. So you're dealing with different decision-making apparatuses, different domestic capacities, different cultural perspectives all the way through here, and they're making mistakes. But that's the ambition in respect of it. Right? Every line on that map comes out of the original plan, and even more scary, global warming has produced a circumstance where navigation routes are, oper are now opening up around the North Pole as well. So the level of connectivity on multiple levels, these are four dramatic ones, but the level of connectivity is opening up everywhere. Here are the secular demographic trends that I touched on earlier. Something like a minimum of 9.3 billion people by 2050, accelerating urbanization, I've spoken to it already. Aging, I haven't spoken to. We are going to see roughly a tripling of, at least 2.7 times, of persons over the age of 60 by 2050. Now, what does that mean? I mean, that's interesting on one level, but what does it mean? It means that for the first time in history, we're going to have four generations competing for economic return associated with some form of work. It's never happened before. How much blockage is there going to occur in the pipeline for employment? How much employment is there going to be? Because the last issue is that what is not the fourth industrial revolution what is in fact the first post-industrial biodigital revolution is going to completely transform the worlds of work and education. And in the middle of that, you're going to have four generations trying to play into it, competitively or otherwise, for some form of economic return. Right? These are really big challenges. We have to think very deeply about how we're going to deal with it. But the problem is that humanity is a complex system embedded in the biogeosphere, which is a complex system of its own, and the two comprise a complex adaptive system in a process of co-evolution. Now, I'm not throwing that word out to say it's complicated. It has a meaning. The first thing is complex systems have many strongly interdependent variables. Think a little bit about how humans behave. They interact with one another all the time in all sorts of different ways. Think about how you behave with the people around you, with your own family, with the people in a classroom, with the people in a shopping mall, with the people in the street, with the people on a train, with the people on an airplane, on social media. You're interacting continuously with a vast number of people, and a lot of what you're doing is having an impact on what other people do. A lot of what they do is having an impact on what you do. Secondly, there are feedback loops throughout all complex systems. So when you make a decision about doing something, you get a whole series of unintended consequences, some of which are perverse. Thirdly, there's a propensity towards chaotic behavior simply because you can't predict outcomes. Nonlinearity produces stochasticism, produces a propensity toward chaos in highly connected systems. You get multiple metastable states in this system. You can think of them as proto-equilibria, those of you who've studied economics. There's no equilibrium. There are simply semi-stable equilibria for relatively brief periods of time in complex systems. And the outcomes are completely non-Gaussian. So if you're looking 20 years down the line and you're making serious predictions, you're talking nonsense. If you hear me make any predictions for 20 years down the line, please say you said you were talking nonsense. Right. Now, when you deal with that and you deal with the reality that complex adaptive systems, so this is now humanity in the biogeosphere, is involved in a process of co-evolution. What happens to us is a function of what happens around us. 
think again in respect of the Dharma protocol in Pakistan. Why do you think what is happening in respect of disease is happening in the context of climate change? It's happening because you've got co-evolution of two different environments. A microbial environment, a bacterial environment, a viral environment, in a climatic environment. As you get shifts in this on a continuing basis, obviously, you're going to get non-established patterns establishing themselves. Just think about how much we fly. I'm on three continents every month for many months. Think of what I am exposed to in terms of bacterial and viral infection potential, just as a consequence of that activity continuously. And, sorry, you've now been infected. I'm standing in the room. Right? This is slightly facetious, but it's real. Because this is what is happening continuously in respect of the world that we live in. Now, how do we deal with this? Because Ferry has a very good habit of always coming back to, yeah, what are the implications for policymakers? What are the implications for policy? What is it that you're trying to say in respect of all of this? So the first question is we have to say, okay, how do we deal with it? What happens firstly here? The more you connect up, I'll show you the algebra at the moment, it's not complicated. But the more you connect up, the more exponential increase you generate in respect to the pattern of outcomes. So the math is quite simple. You get from an arithmetic increase in the number of elements in a system, you get roughly a geometric increase in the number of links and an exponential increase in respect to the number of potential outcomes. Just take one. With 10 elements in the system, you've got 45 links. And oh dear, you've got 35.184 billion potential patterns. When you were at four elements, you only had six links and 64 patterns. All I did was go from four to 10. So the problem is, with that level of connectivity that I was showing you in the diagrams at the beginning, you create effectively a complete impossibility in terms of the computation of outcomes. The number of patterns that can potentially emerge in a complex system under those circumstances are incommensurate. How do we cope? Well, we don't compute. We don't compute at all. We just use learned behaviors. You can think of them as operational heuristics, if you will, but they're learned behaviors. You walk into a room like this, you see a screen up there, you see there's a notebook on the table, you see there's a projector somewhere there, you see people are sitting around in chairs, you say, okay, people are going to give lectures in this room. I, I didn't compute anything. All I did is I've been in this sort of situation many times before, so I can recognize it. And that's how we cope. That's how you cross a road. That's how you decide how you should drive. That's how you deal with people you haven't met before. You apply heuristics in order to deal with it. It's how we navigate complexity. But it's obviously not adequate outside of limited parameters. So if we know that and we know what the secular trends are, what can we say about what we can see happening? No prediction here just what we can see happening today over an horizon plausibly out to something like 2030. The first thing is that we're probably going to see a continuation of the geoeconomic trends that we can see at present. So the center of gravity has been shifting from the Atlantic to the Pacific for the past 20 odd years, and it seems likely that that shift will continue to occur. Asia is likely to be reverting to trend and to be generating significantly more than 50% of global GDP by the end of this century, even as it did in all centuries up to 1820. So that secular trend is likely to continue. It's going to be disruptive. The United States right now is very unhappy about it. 
They are trying to do all sorts of things to stop it. Europe is caught in the middle, completely unsure about how it should play. Trade agreements that have been in place and under negotiation for the past 15 years are fracturing left, right, and center. The internet, which was supposed to, in terms of Berners-Lee's construct, to be a means of global communication, is being segmented off into a series of walled gardens. Expenditure on military defense and potential offensive capability is rising among all of the major powers in the world today. There's a second evident trend that we've seen over the past 30 years and which shows no sign of cooling under present circumstances. We're seeing higher returns to capital, decreasing returns to labor. That's the primary underpinning of the rising social inequality that we've seen across the world. Historically, the rents used to be, in the, most of the 20th century, not too badly distributed. From about 1980 onwards, as a consequence of the adoption of new economic paradigms, influenced highly considerably by the Austrian school, promoted by Margaret Thatcher in rather extraordinary ways, and supported by Ronald Reagan and other persons in the Office of Management and Budget and the Treasury at that time, we have seen increasing returns to capital because of lower taxation on capital, lower taxation on capital gains, on carry-in private equity, and a whole series of other things. And, <coughs> excuse me. and <coughs> as a result of the fact that unionization as a feature of the social landscape has diminished very considerably, a decline in the competitive power of labor relative to capital in negotiation, and as a result of that, higher returns to capital, lower returns to labor. The truth is, however, that this first, thanks, thanks very much, this first post-industrial biodigital revolution that we're starting to see, a surge of developments in infotechnology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and neurotechnology, this is likely to exacerbate that trend very sharply. The degree of monopolization in the digital landscape today with the trillion dollar companies on the NYSE uh, and their equivalents in China is creating a circumstance in which ownership of technology is likely to be rewarded even more than ownership of capital. But if you are an expendable worker in the midst of all of that, the chances that you are going to be able to bargain competitively in any meaningful fashion, whatever, is extremely slim. That almost inevitably has led to jobless growth and significant degrees of social dislocation. And one of the phenomena that we can see across most of the world today has been rising dissatisfaction as a result of those circumstances. And that self-evidently has led to the weakening of representative democracy. It's also posing challenges to autocrats. It's also posing challenges to oligarchies. But that doesn't matter that much. What does matter is that the most effective system of governance that we've managed to develop in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, something which was premised, broadly speaking, on one person, one vote, universal franchise, is under great stress under present circumstances. In the midst of that landscape, we're seeing the return of geopolitics on a highly significant scale. We've seen it across the Mediterranean and out into Central Asia. We've seen it around the former Soviet Union, now Russia, in respect to the near abroad. And we are starting to see it, and we'll see a lot more of it, in both the East China Sea and the South China Sea, in terms of competitive positioning by China, Russia, and Japan. The United States, as a result of the fact that it has its largest naval deployment in the Pacific, is self-evidently going to be a primary actor in respect of this space. And there are lots of warning signals at the moment of the possibility of miscalculation on all sides. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because we were supposed to have put that stuff to bed. Right? The whole post 
Stalin era set of security alliances from NATO through CENTO to SEATO and ANZUS were supposed to have created security blocks on one level. And you remember that Francis Fukuyama told us all that we'd reached the end of history in 1991. The rest of history was going to be spent on the perfection of liberal markets and liberal democracy. Well, of course, that's not true. It never was true. It's a totally anti-Hegelian statement. I mean, Hegel's underlying proposition in respect to the dialectic was the new thesis invites an antithesis and out of the interaction between the two that emerges a new synthesis. So it was always a silly statement. But the fact is we didn't do anything about shoring it up. And so what we're seeing in respect of this geopolitical backlash, for want of a better phrase, was predictable. Now, all of those factors together, the economic factors on your right and the political factors on the left, are driving migration, forced migration, I'm not talking about voluntary migration, on a significant scale, and that's putting further pressure on representative democracy because few countries have got institutions to be able to deal with that sort of challenge when it occurs at scale in short periods. You were talking well in respect of the Syrian crisis. The problem isn't in Europe. Think what the problem's like for Turkey, for Lebanon, and for, for Jordan. None of them have got any institutional capacity to deal with the flood of refugees into those landscapes. And the same is true in other parts of the world where large-scale short-term migration poses fundamental threats. And then, as I said, humanity exists in a geobiosphere. Gaia is just the lyrical word for the Earth system. The Anthropocene is an era in which humanity, at its physical scale, with its high levels of production, consumption, and waste, is impacting on Gaia, impacting on the Earth system, more than the Earth system is impacting on humanity. And if you want to stay in the same lyrical vein, the problem is, from the perspective of humanity, Gaia is going to get her revenge. And if you've ever read the original uh, mythical stories about Gaia, she's not a lady you want to tangle with. So that's the problem. Now, the pro that's one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that this is a system. It's all linked. That shows you some of the linkages, but the more important thing is they reinforce one another. So the revival of geopolitics and migratory flows, the increasing returns to capital, falling returns to labor, the uh, disruptive new congruent technologies and jobless growth, the migratory flows and the weakening of representative democracy, the revival of geopolitics and further problems associated with disruption of Gaia, uh, all of these elements, you can look at all different parts of the system and you have to recognize they are all impacting on one another with potential amplificatory effects, none of them beneficial, all of them likely to cause inflection points for which we're not prepared. This is where we think it is today, but when you're modeling complex systems, you never do it very well. But this is where we think it is today. We think the fundamental drivers are the disruptive new congruent technologies and the fact that we're bumping up against planetary boundaries in the Anthropocene. The pivotal factor is the revival of geopolitics because that disrupts the entire landscape within which we make collective decisions. The outcomes, which are already apparent, of the weakening of representative democracy, jobless growth, migratory flows, and further increasing returns to capital and declining returns to labor. There's nothing that's going to slow that short of large-scale disruption in the short term. It's likely, on the face of that, that we will have another financial crisis which will increase political tensions, both domestically in terms of widening inequalities disrupting regional systems, and potentially threatening the global architecture as a whole. God forbid it happens, but if you look at it from a purely systemic perspective, the risk profile is actually very high. Now, don't take these two too seriously. You can look at them closely if you wish to. You can even download the report. This is the sort of slightly crazy thing that happens in Dubai from time to time.
they have come up with a map of governance up to 2071. They did it in 2017, and I think that's why they selected 71. But these are technological megatrends that are anticipated. They're based largely on both the MIT studies and the Canadian megatrends in respect of that. And these are the social megatrends over that period. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is expect a lot more change happening a lot faster. We've started into a new process in a completely new technological landscape at a point when social resilience is relatively low and political structures are not really capable of managing the system. So, what does all that mean? What it means is that there's a big mismatch between the complexity of the system in which we find ourselves and our capacity to be able to understand their workings. Now, that's why policy isn't very effective. Right? I mean, anyone here got a quick solution for me? Anyone tell me what the policies should be? We, you know, we can solve for this quickly. If, uh, right? if, you, if you go a little bit further, you'll realize why that is because we have pretty rigid and reductionist mental models. We tend to think A causes B. We tend to think if I could just change that, things would be different. And in addition to that, we develop all sorts of fascinating irrational constructs. So in economics, you know, there, there is the uh, efficient market hypothesis, as long as you don't interfere with the market, you'll get the proper equilibria that will emerge at uh, levels of highest efficiency. Uh, human beings are all rational economic actors. This is all nonsense. Everybody knows it's not true. But every single scrap of neoclassical economics over the last 40 years has been premised on these hypotheses. As a result of that, the policies that we then enact play out in the dynamic environment and lead to a whole series of unintended consequences. I mean, Mr. Macron was actually just trying to get France to be competitive in respect of a global landscape in which his predecessors had not succeeded in lengthening the work week and encouraging people to work harder, take less holidays, work more hours, that's all he was trying to do. It wasn't very exciting, right? And look what happened. And part of it is very simple in terms of why it happened. Two thirds of the people who elected Macron came from left of center. The only policies he put in place since being elected as president were policies that benefited factory owners, banks, and rich people. Was it likely to cause a backlash in respect of the others? Yeah. Does that mean it wasn't a good idea to try to get France to be more competitive in Britain? No, it doesn't mean it wasn't. It just means he did one thing outside of context and disrupted the balance absolutely fundamentally. You need prudent, sensible policy on the fiscal level, but you have to have instruments that strengthen social cohesion and reduce inequality at the same time. So we have lots of unintended consequences. Much of the policy that comes out of legislation, have a look what's been happening around the efforts to prevent the closure of government and bring in border security in the United States since before uh, the beginning of the year. You've got compromises, trade-offs, an absolute mess. Nobody believes in the outcome in any meaningful fashion. And even well-conceived policies give rise to considerable degrees of public cynicism and distrust. That point made earlier about trust as being absolutely central in terms of the management of social affairs is absolutely core. So from complexity to large-scale social dissatisfaction. Now, when you take it up from the national level to the global level, the problem becomes even worse. Because as human society is a complex system embedded in the biogeosphere, you can take a metaphor out of theoretical physics, which is called symmetry breaking, to explain what is happening on a global scale. 
The problem arises from a silly metaphor that Tom Friedman gave us about the global village. If you think about how a village functions, in a village, the economy and the society are commensurate. There's no big economy outside of the society. Otherwise, you're not in the village anymore. So a village is a place where there's a reasonable degree of social balance because the economy and the society are commensurate. The economy serves the purposes of the society. The role of the polity in a village is just to intervene on the margins to handle conflict and to try to guide people to sensible behavior when tempers are flared. But that's not the case on the, glo on the global level at all. You have a highly connected global economy and you have an utterly fractured global society. You know, we use this wonderful phrase in the context of the United Nations all the time. We talk about the international community. What on earth is the international community today? Community suggests an identity of view largely formed by an identity of values and interests. Where is that in the global landscape today? But we do have a highly connected economy. Digitization, integrated banking systems, long value chains. Until this is fractured by the rejection of existing trade agreements, provides for a tremendous degree of inherent asymmetry between the economy and the society at the global level. And the polity, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, are completely inadequate in terms of squaring the circle between those elements. So symmetry breaking is inevitable under those circumstances. Very simply put, that's the way the global economy was structured. Technological integration, global financial institutions, and global supply chains. But fractured global societies, resurgent nationalism, sectarianism, and interstate conflict, great tensions. The polity, completely incapable of managing that tension in any meaningful fashion, whatever. Hence, the institutions themselves come under stress, and their attempts at intervention don't do very much in order to assist anything. Geopolitically, this is exacerbated by the fact that the historical post-Second World War institutions, the IMF, the Bank, the United Nations, the WTO, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, etc., are not serving the purposes of China because they haven't adjusted to the rise of China in any meaningful fashion. China made a serious attempt to get the Huan, the Remembe, within the basket of IMF currencies, took five years longer than it should have taken relative to the rules of the IMF in terms of how to weight the currencies. The changes in quotas and voting rights within both the IMF and the World Bank took about nine years longer than they should have and then were delayed for a further two years because the Senate wouldn't ratify them in the United States. So China went on with it. It created the new BRICS Development Bank, it created the Silk Road Fund, it created the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, etc. These are complementary, in one sense, institutions, but they're fundamentally changing the working of the global architecture in important ways. And Mr. Putin is not unhappy. He doesn't like the sense that Russia was rendered dependent as a result of the idiocies of the Yeltsin era. He has spent the whole of his life since he first put out this thesis at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, seeking to reduce Russia's dependency, seeking to render it a peer competitor, seeking to ensure that he exercises control over the near abroad. So this stuff over here is completely inadequate in respect of handling those particular challenges. And that's translating into similar tensions in terms of representative democracy. One sort are anti-democrats who haven't changed the system per se, but never forget that Hitler came to power through democratic means. So leadership cults on the extreme right and the extreme left, the rights tend to be ultra-nationalist, ultra the lefts tend to be uh, internationalist in the old-fashioned sense of the term, 
in politically cultural, sorry, politically liberal, affluent, and culturally homogeneous states, nativism tends to rise with diversity because of the difficulties associated with assimilation. You've got problems like that in Syria, too. The fundamental issues in Syria at the end of the day are Alawite, Sunni, and Kurd. Well, it's nativism run right, and it was then exploited by a variety of external actors as well as some internal actors to create the absolute catastrophe that one has in respect of Syria today. And then the third category are classic populists uh, who use the instrument of democratic illiberalism. I think the way to think about all of this is that nativism is a normative popular uh, objective. So Brexit is driven by nativism in a certain sense. Populism is a means to achieve that. Of course, shoot. Shoot. No. So therefore, you can say, as you've just done, Brexit is about nativism. The way it's being exploited, though, is about pushing a populism which makes the outcome much more likely to fit with a few characters. I agree. No, no, I agree. The, the, the only point, the reason I'm, I'm you know, let, let's be perfectly honest, when, when, when you take a complex thought and you're trying to represent it in a picture, you're always oversimplifying. But, but I think if you wanted to characterize Brexit, it is taking back control. Otherwise, there's no logic behind it at all. And that, is, that fits nativism better than anything else. But the instruments were populist, right? Bojo is a populist. Bojo is not a nativist at all. He's an absolute cosmopolitan. But he is a populist exploiting a sense of a desire for nativism. All right, so, okay, this is where we are. Now, how on earth would we change? Because clearly, this is not a good place to be. And clearly, we would like to try and improve things. How do humans change? Well, one way is adaptation. This is the long evolutionary cycle. So everything you know from evolutionary biology suggests that changes in behavior, physiology, and structure are undertaken in order to fit environments. It takes a long time, unfortunately. It doesn't happen very quickly. Organisms that happen to have heritable traits that are well suited to the particular environment in which they find themselves are more likely to survive and reproduce. We talk about that as evolutionary fitness. So that's one way. The second way is a paradigm shift. Right? We come to the conclusion that the way we've been doing things isn't working anymore. We've pushed it to the outer limits of what we can do with the system that we've got at the moment. And we get a bright idea which says, if we did it that way, it would be better. Now, the archetype of this in terms of Thomas Kuhn's original writings around this is, of course, Newtonian physics pushed to its limit. And then the clerk in the patent office in Zurich comes up with a special theory of relativity. And the world changes highly significantly from that. But the point about it is you understand you push the existing system as far as it can go, and you decide to make a decision to go somewhere else. And the third is revolution. Revolutions are really very simple. That's how societies change. They change when the pace of technological, social, and economic change, or any two of the three, is so fast and so large that the institutions that represent the present are incapable of adapting to it. And under those circumstances, it's either a political revolution or, on occasion, a social movement that brings about a fundamental degree of transformation. Those are the only three ways that we know about how the human species changes. And the real question that we face today is whether or not we can avoid that. We haven't got time to do that. So we'd have to reach a conclusion over here that would shift us in a different direction. Now, the trouble about it is that humans do things when they want to cause changes. They start out by saying, this is McKinsey's seven S's, those of you who know it. We, we agree on goals, so we agree on a strategy, and that tells us what structure and systems and skills and leadership and management style and staffing we require to implement that strategy. This is classic planning, right? It's classic business design. It's classic strategic management framework. Okay, 
that's good, but it's almost impossible to do at scale because it requires shared values, what I was calling earlier agreed normative framework at the center of all of this to make it happen, and it would be jolly difficult to construct that in today's environment. Even more dangerous, when you can't do that, in complex systems, you risk inflection points, which tip the system in a completely different direction and create highly unpredictable outcomes. And of course, in the course of human history to date, or not human history, Earth history to date, we have had ma five major extinction events. So systems, sometimes, when they reach inflection points, adjust in wholly remarkable ways with enormous consequences. And if I can take you back to Martin Rees's proposition about there's a 50% chance that humanity will survive the 21st century, he didn't quite have in mind a total sixth extinction, although there are people who argue that we are well down the path to that. But he was basically saying that we might hit a number of inflection points which would make it impossible for the species to survive. So then you've got to say, all right, well, we don't want that. That's not a good idea. So let's try and think about how humans function when they function well. Well, humans are mammals. And they behave exactly the same way that other mammals do, because that's the way their neurophysiology and their neurochemistry works. So the first thing that has enabled the human species to survive is fear. We have amygdala back here, and when we see something in our peripheral vision that looks threatening or looks dangerous or whatever, then a little bit like the cockroach, who immediately, when you turn on the light, scuttles under the nearest <laughs> piece of furniture, humans do something. And the classic expression of that is always fight or flight. It's actually fight, flight, or play dead in reality. That's how humans survive under those sort of circumstances. So that's the first part. The second part is want. And want extends beyond greed, but includes greed. It also includes lust. Because absent that, there wouldn't be any propagation of the species. So the underlying want, which is preeminently driven by the dopamine system in humans, encourages both propagation of the species and the accumulation of excess. Squirrels and everything else ahead of a winter run around and gather up a whole lot of stuff in order to protect themselves against the fact that they can't run around during the winter to go and get stuff and there probably won't be a lot of it around. The root cellars in Scandinavia. I mean, there are hundreds of examples in respect of this. So this concept of accumulation and this concept of procreation is all driven by the dopamine system. Now, if that was all there was, we would be in a perpetual state of war. Because anything that wasn't like us would be an object of threat. We would spend, the males would spend their lives raping people. The females would presumably wish to do something in order to procreate. And everybody would be fighting for scarce resources. It would be a total catastrophe. There would be no such thing as society. So it's balanced by something that is driven preeminently by oxytocin, and you can express it as social empathy. It's about bonding community, usually premised on shared identity and common norms, but its neurochemical origin is the hormone that is reduced, or sorry, produced in the system when a baby suckles at its mother's breast. Women have far higher oxytocin levels than men, which is one of the reasons why men fight more. If a man wants to have high levels of oxytocin experience, he has to go and watch something like beautiful sunsets over the sea or sunrises over the mountains or things like that, which is associated with a significant rise in oxytocin. But that which holds human society together is driven by neurochemical urges which are fundamentally related to encouraging the mother to keep the baby with her for an extended period despite the inconvenience of so doing. So social cohesion is a function of empathy. And a well-balanced human, a human in homeostasis, has all three of those elements playing out simultaneously and they're reasonably well-balanced. When they're not, we tend to call them psychopaths. Right? Males, historically, who have demonstrated high degrees of empathy, 
and relatively low degrees of militarism associated with fear and greed have been called woofs and wimps and all sorts of other funny things. Society is structured on this imbalance. And if you take that one step further, that's how we construct societies. First of all, to have successful societies, we have to have high degrees of personal freedom. Because absent that, you would have no innovation, no creativity, and thus very little progress. Associated with that, however, we need to have a sense of responsibility to community. Because in the absence of that, with purely personal freedom, there would be no society. There couldn't be. And particularly today, although arguably at any point in human history, you have to have respect for the ecosystem on which you depend for your survival. Ask yourself an interesting question. Why are the pyramids and the sphinx in the desert? Why, those of you who know something about the Middle East more broadly, why are Pasargad and Takht Jamshid surrounded by desert? The answer is they exhausted the ecological ability of the environment to support the size of the civilization. You have the same thing spread across the entire area from the Tigris and the Euphrates down onto the peninsula. You have similar phenomena in respect of arrant stupidity in the United States, where the decision to build railways across the United States from east to west meant that you had to stop Buffalo stampeding across the tracks because they tended to crash into the trains or the trains crashed into them. Clearly, the Plains Indians, who relied highly significantly on the buffalo as a significant part of their ecosystem, they ate their meat, they used their skins, they were fundamentally part of a cooperative ecosystem, resented this to slaughter. And that led to the creation of the 5th Cavalry and the 7th Cavalry to get rid of the Plains Indians because, after all, they were interfering with the running of the railways. People do extraordinarily stupid things. But if you get that balance right, society works. And interestingly enough, if you look at all of the sacred texts across the entirety of humanity, you will find that that balance is expressed in many different ways and different cultural contexts, but right across the whole of it. I'm just going to show you this very quickly. It's not important, but it's just to show you that an understanding of the nature of this problem has now reached the educated media. This is David Brooks in the New York Times. Second bullet point, society came to be seen as an atomized collection of individual economic units pursuing self-interest. Selfishness was normalized. As Perlstein puts it, old-fashioned norms around loyalty, cooperation, honesty, equality, fairness, and compassion no longer seem to apply in the economic sphere. Anything you could legally do to make money was deemed okay. Social trust arises from a covenant. I give to my company, my town, and my government, and they give back to me. But that covenant was ripped. As we disembedded individuals from traditional moral norms, we disembedded companies from social ones. Capitalism is a wonderful system, but capitalism needs to be embedded in moral norms and it needs to serve a larger social good. Remoralizing and re-socializing the market is the great project at the moment. The crucial question is not how can we have a good economy, it's how can we have a good society. How can we have a society in which it's easier to be a good person? So the debate's out there now. It's not, it's not an abstruse debate any longer. And there's discussion about what a new social contract might look like. This is the paradigm shift part of the discussion, right? You know, J.M. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes famously said that uh, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Um, today, I'm not even sure that's true anymore, although everyone is still trapped in the neoliberal paradigm. But the world has changed faster than the profession. And if you think about it, it's fairly obvious once again what the key requirements of a new social contract would have to be. You'd have to be able to address the sources of acute inequality and deep inequity because it's causing large-scale social disruption. Even if you don't have any deep moral sense, 
it would be utterly necessary to be able to address that just for pragmatic reasons. You have to restore possibilities for upward mobility. One of the terrifying things about the situation in the United States today is that the correlation between economic status at birth and opportunity for a decent education are sitting around the 0.91 level. It's, you, you can't run a society on that sort of basis. You have to provide social safety nets for those who are not capable of being reskilled and accommodated in labor markets. Don't get me wrong, a kid of 17 today will possibly, in an advanced economy, survive through this digital disruption and biological disruption that we're going to see in respect to the new revolution. A steel worker of 53, who's potentially got 30 odd years more of life, is not going to be capable of being reconfigured in that landscape. And think a little bit, I couldn't care less who you vote for or what you do, it's of no interest to me, but think a little bit about the demographics of those who voted for Brexit and those who vote for Mr. Trump. So you have to be able to address those issues. You have to be able to invest in the transformation of education and skills training to allow for horizontal mobility and lifelong learning. If we are going to go through a technological revolution that is even more disruptive than the first, if you will, industrial revolution from 1780 to 1860, Please understand that revolution did leave Victorian Britain at the panoply of the pinnacle of power. But along the way, it helped trigger the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the revolutions of 1848, the passage of the Great Reform Act in Britain and the Second Reform Act, potentially the Irish, well, undoubtedly the Irish famine in terms of economic policy. No, but, but in the sense that it was driven by a desire to be able to get the corn or the into, in, uh, potatoes into Britain at prices that could, in fact, uh, there's no question. So if you take all of that, don't imagine the technological revolutions don't cause social chaos. They do. We have no example in history where they didn't. So if you don't get out ahead of this curve in order to engineer for it, we are going to face enormous challenges. You have to be able to deal with the intergenerational challenges that are heightened by aging. I spoke of four generations competing for economic opportunity, and you have to build social capital and cohesion in order to build resilience in societies as you go through the stresses of this experience. This is really a no-brainer. This is not an advocacy position. It's not the platform of a political party. It's just if we don't fix it, then the inflection points are going to bite us. I've spoken briefly about Macron. The balance between fiscal prudence and equity and sustainability is essential. You could argue that his reversal of what he had proposed to do, having pushed France out of the Maastricht limit in terms of its, uh, its fiscal uh, de deficit this year, suggests that it can't be handled within national confines alone. And that's probably true. If we don't develop something resembling an international consensus about the nature of the challenge we face and how we are going to be able to deal with it, we're going to see tax arbitrage, we're going to see regulatory arbitrage in the same way that we saw in the, month, in the years leading up to the international financial crisis. If you can get to a situation where Apple pays no tax because of a rather complex relationship which eventually has it in Ireland where it doesn't sell anything and therefore can't be liable for any tax, then by definition, the world is going to fall apart. So let's think about how some of these things might be put in place. There are instruments that we're quite familiar with, means-tested minimum income programs or a universal basic income program. On the left are the more conservative ones, on the right are the more extensive ones. Relatively high threshold negative income taxes or smaller minimum uh, income taxes and uh, child allowances and social pensions. There's plenty of ways to skin the cat if you decide that it's necessary to start addressing these challenges in this way. And there's some quite, in all cases, you have to prioritize the most vulnerable. And there's some quite good thinking starting to come out of the more enlightened people in the World Bank about how you would distribute risk uh, 
in the system from the individual to the state as you went through this type of exercise. If you think about it, it takes us back to Amartya Sen's construct of development as freedom. Sen argued very simply that individuals must have individual capability, independent capability, to allow them to escape from and to avoid deprivation. He said that political freedoms, economic facilities, social opportunities, protective security, and guarantees of transparency are what's broadly speaking necessary to try to achieve agency. The constructs in any society will differ, but the scale of the challenge is more or less common. It's more acute in circumstances where there's already been large-scale disruption. There's more scope for action in societies that still have decent economic resource available to them, but we share the challenge. The ILO has just come out with an interesting report addressing the question of work for a brighter future. It's broadly speaking perfectly sensible. It doesn't go quite far enough in some areas, and they've got a an aspirational statement in the central section, which doesn't seem to me likely of realization. They're saying that we must ensure that all deployments of artificial intelligence in uh, industrial and uh, service-oriented applications in the future are under human control. I think that horse is already bolted. I don't think we can do anything except close the door behind it. But it's an interesting further illustration of the fact that thinking is starting to take place sensibly around the issue. When you scale it up, the question becomes, how do you make it work on a global level? How do you get that international collaboration that enables the individual state not to find itself in a weakened position as a result of adopting sensible policies? and recognize that since 2011, Danny Roderick, who's at MIT nowadays, said something very sensible. It's roughly like what I was saying about the symmetry breaking between the economy of the society and the inadequacy of the polity. He said quite simply, you can't have an integrated global economy where the effect of that is to diminish the capacity of national governments to serve the welfare of their citizens and still try to maintain national sovereignty Un, uh, underpinned by democracy. The strains in the system will simply be too large. So if that's the case, then when you're thinking about what you can do at transnational scales, it may be worthwhile thinking about what I'm describing as a triadic structure. There are certain key global public goods and behavior that threatens the tragedy of the commons, which actually require supranational coordination. There's a second set of things where cooperation and harmonization of rules on a variety of things will put us in a much better position than we are today. And there's a third set of things where debate and shared commitments, even if we don't put any institutional frameworks in place, will probably work best. Subsidiarity, that wonderful word of the European Union, is a pretty good rule under these sorts of circumstances. I'm only showing you this for one simple reason. Going all the way back to Galileo, it was well understood that small things have got highly significant advantages that big things don't have. In that sense, small is beautiful. Right? You can drop a flea from an amazingly great height without breaking anything. If you drop an elephant from an amazingly great height, it will turn into a wet puddle. So, it is that much more difficult to manage at scale. It comes with the territory. There's not very much we can do about it. I'm not gonna take you through the math on this, but you can look at it, those of you who are interested. There, is, there seems to be, there seems to be a discernible maximum of complexity and respective interests and a separate but similar maximum in respective diversity of values that we can accommodate in terms of collective action. When we try and develop the formula for it, we think this is a good heuristic. Right? We're testing it in a variety of areas at the moment. It's gonna be interesting to see how it stands up to empirical investigation, but it's based on that triadic structure. Out of, out of this comes that triadic structure that I offered you. And I'm gonna close just with this observation over here. <clears throat> 
This is an article that I was asked to critique recently. Dennis Snow has just stepped down as the president of the Institute for the World Economy in Kiel. And he's doing an article for the Global Solutions Initiative for the T20 this year for the Japanese G20 process. And I distilled out of it to indicate where I agreed and where I didn't agree, six principles which I think really matter. And I think these are the issues. Cooperation is possible within and between groups of humans. And cooperative behaviors give advantage in intergroup competition. Cooperation, which you can think of in this sense as social cohesion, is strengthened by moral narratives and buttressed by institutions which shape group identities and norms. That, by the way, is what the populists are doing. Individuals can adopt and reconcile the demands of several identities and act within moderately diverse normative frameworks. Everyone in this room is a father or a son, or a mother, or a daughter, or a sister, or an aunt. Everyone is a member of some or other social or professional body. Everyone has a national identity in some or other fashion and possibly lives in another society. Every one of us has different identities. And as long as those identities are not fundamentally mutually exclusive, we can have lots of identities at the same time. So it's perfectly possible to be able to do that. But in each group, there has to be high symmetry between the scales of the economy, the society, and the polity, and the moral narratives that inform the identity of each is what enables us to operate efficiently. When groups have to function at different scales, symmetry and efficiency is enhanced by subsidiarity. Europe understood that 20 years ago. It hasn't been entirely consistent in applying it, but it understood that 20 years ago. And moral and functional asymmetry Normative confusion and institutional dysfunction now unfortunately characterize the world we live in and require that we realign in fairly significant ways because we can't carry on in the fashion in which we're operating at the moment. The big challenges that we have to deal with is that there is persistent cultural diversity in a digitally, financially, and industrially connected world. There is rising political and civilizational competition from large-scale geoeconomic shifts. There are feedback loops between divergent historical narratives and the power that each exercised at different times. I'm spending a huge amount of time doing discussions between the United States, other democratic countries, so-called, and China at the moment. The narratives are completely different because they're based on fundamentally different historical experiences. And therefore, this problem is a pluridimensional puzzle with lots of emergent properties which we can't predetermine and multiple metastable states. It's going to be very, very challenging to be able to deal with this. So the simple reality, I'm not going to go into the detail. This is an article that's worthwhile looking at if any of you haven't seen it yet. It's called Artificial Intelligence and Political Science. And they've come up with an interesting thesis. I don't think it's helpful, but it's, it's, it's well argued and it's interesting. We propose a mechanism through which girls and their achievement in girl-directed actions can be emerging properties of self-organizing networks not initially endowed with intentionality. In other words, don't plan for outcomes. Allow the evolution of outcomes to emerge. If you think about it, the way in which the world will function is by combining a sense of respect for limits, boundaries, with a commitment to welfare and a high degree of engagement. You've got to have a balance between those three. When you push beyond the limits of either one of them, you get the backlashes that we're looking at at the moment. And along the way to it, I wish I could tell you it's going to be easy. I wish I could tell you I knew what the pathway was going to be. I wish I could give you a Google map. But the truth is, all we can do is invest into insight into present conditions and as much foresight as we can generate going forward. That means we have to invest in information, skills, and knowledge. We must use that consistently to mitigate and manage the risks we assume and build resilience against shocks. But in this type of period, you have to brace for the certainty of turbulence. You have to accept the need to manage risks that are inherent in uncertainty. And that means two things. You need an organic ability to be able to anticipate rapid 
discontinuous and nonlinear change, and you need enough resilience to enable survival, adaptation, and the management of shocks that you couldn't foresee. There's going to be plenty. You didn't plan for the future you're living at the moment. But you've survived. Thanks very much indeed. Wow.